Do you listen to hip hop? Nah, so so. What music do you listen to? I stopped listening to music, especially hip hop. I listened to uh, Zim dancehall. All right. But hip hop, I stopped listening because I realized that these guys have been actually created by white monopoly to kill each other and make and 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 to and, and to, 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 to 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 what you call it psychologically engineers to think in a certain way consumption um uh, um 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 using women and uh objectifying women and really not driving any agenda that's other than a selfish self-centered agenda of 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 egotisticness that's a problem for me and this R&B of people that will be singing i will die for you and she's yes. but boys to me you got to admit though. and i believe that all the kids i've got is because of R. Kelly and what he taught us about bumping and grinding no no but boys so i went bumping no, no, and yeah grinding. the boys to me and kids said though, <laughs> but that era those niggas were smooth though they were smooth, but they they, they they corrupted us. They made us think of sex and nothing else, bruh. All right. Cool. Anyway, guys, uh, anyway, guys, welcome to another exciting, explosive episode of the Bold uh, co- Exchange with none other than the one and only Rutendo Martinara. It's actually quite a, a fascinating surname for someone who actually talks that much. Hey, how you doing, brother, man? <laughs> Alex, I'm good, brother. How, how, how's um, everything? It's good. And you know, the the, the, the surname is actually uh, a name for a vegetable ah. that comes from Mozambique. Wow. And that is where the surname actually comes from. It's, it's got nothing to do with talking as such. Ah, so it's not originally Zimbabwe. <laughs> like, all right. Oh, no, no, interesting, interesting. Yo, so yeah. like, uh, I was actually we were having a conversation like behind the scenes earlier on, and then we we're talking about, remember how, I want to know where you were um, on the 29th of December. 2930, 31, Nipabu. Area Yoyo, not December, 1999, just before the world is coming to an end. Like <laughs> Y2K. Y2K. <laughs> like. I, was, I was already in SA then. All right. And when I got to SA, all I loved to do was party. All right. Partying women. Sorry. So I was probably in the club, uh, probably partying or... Maybe I'm talking too much. Let me and see. interesting, it's interesting that you mentioned women because I remember, I remember my. I actually think that's what my, 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 I made my son. But anyway. In in to be because I remember that time I was broke, like really broke. I remember my first heartbreak. This is about sixteen. Tell me about your first heartbreak. How bad was Dude, it? Dude, my first heartbreak was um, there was a girl called Chido. She was nice. She was right. beautiful. Went to Gateway. And um, I'd been quoting her for some time. We were going for movies, kissing, da, da 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 So eventually, we got to go to club. Now, my dad would not give you his car to go to club. So I then had to get my uncle to drive us to club, get to club. We're getting out of the car. And then this guy called Dean Mamuka just rolls up in his ride, bruh. And he <laughs> took the chick from me before the end of the night. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, what happened is I was a boy and he was a man, and the boy lost the girl. <laughs> I'll never forget that. It was painful, bro. Is, is, is that why you're fascinated with firearms and weapons and guns? I mean, that's one of your like really interest. Like you, you got. A, <laughs> <laughs> I plotted your revenge. Like tell me about that. Like you, you, you into um, hunting and you know you're fascinated by uh, weapons and firearms. Like what? Where where does that stem from? Um, it stems from the need for us to defend ourselves. Uh, as Zimbabweans, we're brought up in this culture that we look down upon guns. We don't want anything to do with them. I understand that because we don't have a violent society because of that. But when I started traveling the world, I realized how aggressive, how um, um, uh, aggressive the world is and the fact that everything is about war. Everything is about fighting. So you've got to learn to fight. You've got to learn to protect yourself. And as Africans, we're weak at that. You can't protect your family in a in a culture or a country where people have got guns and knives and weapons if you don't if you're not armed. So you got to learn to be armed. When I was uh, younger, I used to do martial arts, but then you get to a point where you realize without a weapon, you're not going to be able to defend yourself. You can't defend your family. That's how I got into it, and I love to look for my own food. So I always think that we're going to get to a point where you know you know those movies, the dystopian movies, where there is nothing functional. But you have to feed yourself and you sound family. like you're digging up a bank or something. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, carry on, carry on. <laughs> I'm one of those guys who would do that. But you know, on the banker thing, so let's say digging a banker for a nuclear holocaust. If there's a nuclear holocaust, I don't think I'd actually want to live after that. So 
I probably wouldn't want to be in a bunk and then come out and everything is dead and desolate. You know interesting, I mean? interesting, interesting. So let's get to the to the more spicy and interesting stuff, right? <laughs> um, I'm, 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 I'm with my friends. We're like watching, consuming this uh, newsroom Africa interview. Yo, you are making a meal of this room. I think... I think they, should, they could have pinned uh, like some molestation allegations after what you did on that interview. And then 24 hours later, this thing is actually taken down, right? And I'm like, ah, well, it's not out of our blood. It's just right. It's just right. You know what I mean? And then, I, I, then uh, days later, I start seeing that interview resurfacing on other platforms, on TikTok and stuff like that. And then it got me thinking, what did you say? Who did you piss off? And why is it important to censor information currently? And, and you know, what is so sad is that you've got this country, South Africa, prides itself in being uh, a country that uh, has got democratic values, free speech, uh, free expression. But they're always censoring people who have a perspective that is uh, non-neoliberal. So they actually have freedom of expression for neoliberals and everybody else must be cancelled and must be censored. And I can't really blame uh, Newsroom Africa because the censorship started way before that. All right. SABC actually put out a decree that I'm not allowed to come there, and anybody who brings me there will be fired. And one of the presenters that used to bring me there was reprimanded very uh, uh, excessively for bringing me there and giving a different narrative on the Zimbabwe story and awakening South Africans to the truth about what is happening in Zimbabwe. You've got 702, it's a radio station. Yeah. When I used to call in, as a caller, from outside, my narrative was so powerful that they actually gave their presenters an instruction that I should never be let to come there. And this I was being told by presenters who worked there who were telling me, dude, stop calling in. You actually get, you're putting out- You're causing us problems because yeah, yeah. every time you call in, then white people call in, and threaten to withdraw the advertising. And management has to grill our presenters every time to say, why do you bring him on? So by the time that Newsroom Africa did that thing, they actually were, they broke their own rules by allowing me to come to studio in the first place. Wow. And even when I came into studio, I told the guys even before we started that this show is going to be removed offline before the end of the day. And what's ironic is that the numbers that I'd given Newsroom Africa on Twitter and on uh, 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 what you call it, YouTube, YouTube yeah, yeah. were bigger than anything else that they'd ever had before. But then they were forced to remove it. So you asked why. Why do they censor such voices? Because once you come with a pro-African narrative in a world with businesses that advertise and businesses that own these media outlets that are white and pro-imperialism, they're not going to want you to give that narrative because you awaken the black mind, which they require to remain sleeping. That's why they only promote artists, musicians, rappers, because they talk sex, they talk uh, alcohol, they, they talk, talk consumption. They, yeah, consumption, they yeah, destroy yeah. the black mind and stop it from focusing on the serious issues. And I'm making black people focus on the serious issues, but in a way that black people are willing to listen to. That's a threat to white supremacy. Do you, think, do you think black people are ready to, to consume such information and just to instill on the, on the media and propaganda side of these media that control stuff? Why is it that if black people are killed in America by cops, right? Let's just say 200 black people are killed in America by cops and then one person who's disturbing the peace is beaten up in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. The narrative about Zimbabwe is that there is no rule of law and then it's an infringement of human rights. And then when it happens in America, it's like, nah, black people are, you know, it's this black lives don't matter. It's, you know, it was just, it's, uh, we need to put more money into the police force. We should change policing. There's this cute little language they have for it. Like, why is it that with us, it's human rights, we, it's, it's human rights. And then with them, it's policing problem. You know, you know, we need to change our approach to policing. It's called the manufacturing of consent or a manufacturing of a narrative. And uh, Neil Chomsky wrote a book about this. It's all about the um, imperialists creating a narrative that suits the protection of imperialism and the neoliberal outlook 
and then demonizes anything else that is outside that because they have the ability to do that with the power of their media. They have the voice. They have the mainstream media. They control global media, which then syndicates its information from America into other countries. And in South Africa, they're utilizing the South African media in exactly the same way in that it is a white-sponsored media that creates an anti-black narrative that is then syndicated into the African continent and then talks to the West about what's happening in Africa from a South African white apartheid perspective. And that is why, you see, we've got black faces there, including Zimbabweans, All right. who demonize Zimbabwe, create a narrative that Zimbabwe has got no human rights. Yet when Marikana happened in South Africa, we never heard the word human rights being spoken about. And the black South Africans who are complicit in creating this narrative don't realize that they dehumanize themselves together with those people that were murdered in, in Marikana by simply not calling it what it is, which is a human rights violation. We had an incident right now, Simba Chitando, the guy who's representing people on the ZDP. He represented truck drivers, Zimbabwean truck drivers, 200 of them, that were killed between two, uh, 2018 and 2020 in South Africa. You're telling me the 200 truck drivers lost their lives yes. in an African country and no media said a exactly. word about them. And they were killed in xenophobic attacks by black South Africans trying to stop Zimbabwean truck drivers from being truck drivers in South Africa. These are Zimbabwean truck drivers who are driving South African registered trucks and Zimbabwean registered trucks, Zambian registered trucks, and Mozambican registered trucks. They were targeted specifically, systematically. And when they were murdered like that, when the reports were made to the police, the police did nothing, the Ministry of Justice did nothing, and the, 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 the presidency did nothing. So Simba Chitando was forced to go and report the South African government to the International Court of Justice. So the ICC has got a complaint by Simba Chitando over xenophobic killings and murders and human rights violations of Zimbabweans by South Africans and the South African government, but you never heard anything about it in the media. But, the, but now that the South African, is ha South African government is having issues with Americans and they're taking sides with the Russians, the Russians they seemed yeah. to be taking sides with the Russians, you're going to see that ICC case being resurrected because the ICC said to Simba Chitando, we're going to keep observing and we'll keep updating our files on this case. Eventually, you're going to hear them starting to talk about this and starting to try to persecute the South African government based on a report that was made well, three years ago, and they did nothing about it then. You see, the problem I actually have, and when it comes to, when we're still talking about this media thing, is that we are being forced to see ourselves through the eyes of, you know, whether it's National Geographic, CNN, BBC. It's like we're being told how to perceive ourselves and then the other problem and i would like to thank you for actually coming through to our show like you know 100 percent black owned independent and it's like we hate ourselves so much that we want to see ourselves in their media and how important is it for us to control our own platforms and you know we got we got haku stream shameless plug um we got 11 dogs production and everything I mean, how important is it for us to create our own platforms to actually then tell the stories? Because if you say something that, like, you were taken down on YouTube, I mean, I'm sure you've had people report you on Twitter and, you know, like, so, I mean, how important is it to create those platforms and actually then make conscientize people to say, yo, you guys, jump on this platform, it won't be censored, and it promotes you in a good light. Before we go on to alternative media, All right. we have to accept that SABC is a South African broadcasting corporation that is run by a broadcasting act created by an independent black government. So that should be our platform in terms of she should be a black platform, should be a black South African platform, and should be an African platform because it is then springboarded into our houses all across the African continent through DSTV. Yes. So that's why we took them to the Broadcasting Complaints, uh, uh, Complaints Commission of South Africa to say that this broadcaster has an obligation to report accurately on African issues and black issues, and it has to be balanced and not have an anti-Zimbabwean narrative, yet it is being paid for by our monies in Africa and by black South Africans who form the majority who need to be informed well on the Zimbabwean issue. Right. And for them to censor voices like mine when I come and try to give a narrative... You also found on the SABC? No, no, no. Oh, right. When I go there, but I've, been, I've, been, I've, been, I've also been censored on the right. SABC 
they recently after the after the um newsroom, newsroom Africa, Africa mm. they called me to their studio they needed the numbers to talk about um they needed the numbers <laughs> yeah. but again they were they, these were producers who wanted my voice to be on the station but the directors the fat black guys right. who are behind the scenes who support white imperialism yet they 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 also moan about it are the ones who refused for it to be put on 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 YouTube because I exposed the lies that Hope Hope speaks. I gave clarity right, we'll on the issue. We'll, we'll get to the Hope Hope issue. I, I gave I gave the I gave a narrative on the job sikala issue, and I gave a narrative on Zimbabwe that they don't want to be propagated. Right. Zimbabwe must be seen as a country that is unruly, a country that is backward, a country that is primitive, and it's black people that are making. So I'm saying, it should it's wrong. That, that platform is not called ours. It is it's a black platform by a black government and being paid for by black taxpayers and our monies on DSTV. Then we have the white media. I don't expect the white media to support us, but I expect the South African parliament and the South African government to make laws that make it illegal for the apartheid narrative, a neo-Nazi narrative, to continue to be propagated to destroy the minds of black South Africans and Africa as a whole. And then now comes to your guys' platforms. You are now creating alternative platforms because our own black governments on the African continent have done nothing to create platforms that speak to black minds, that reach black minds all across the African continent and empower the black person. You are struggling to create this institution. You're putting in your own monies, putting in your own resources. The question is why hasn't the government of Zimbabwe put money behind that? Because you have to create alternative voices to the narrative being created in South Africa by whites who put money to create the neo-Nazi narrative that keeps black people feeling inferior. So our governments must counter that by creating a pro-African voice that empowers the black African mind and empowers the African technician. Young people that I'm seeing behind the cameras here should be empowered so that their skills can dominate African narratives and can then begin to spread the message throughout the African continent. And, you know, you talk about white media. Sorry, like you talk about media in South Africa, right? I want to ask a question, though, like just, just why is why is the media in South Africa so nice to sit on my poster, but they were so tough and heavy ended on, 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 on Jacob Zuma? The question is, why was the media in South Africa friendly to sit on my poster? Because it's changing its position now. Serious? Oh, yes. See, Cyril Ramaphosa came in as perceived as the darling of whiteness. And he was perceived to be somebody who was going to advance white interests. He was going to advance white businesses. He was going to re reinstall the apartheid system and domination of whites upon blacks uh, as, a, as a black leader. That was the perception. But that hasn't happened. In fact... Ciro Ramaphosa is now gravitating away from the Western leaning position that South Africa had, even under Jacob Zuma, to a Russian and Chinese leaning position. He has stood with Russia uh, uh, in its invasion by saying that he's neutral. Truth of the matter is he's supporting Russia instead of Ukraine. All right. He has stood behind Zimbabwean sanctions more aggressively than any other leader before. You've heard Sfikil and Balula recently yeah. denouncing the CCC as a party that has used sanctions to try and cause regime change in Zimbabwe because it is a puppet of the U.S. government. Thabo Mbeki never said that. In fact, he legitimized the CCC by forcing them into a GNU government with our government on the threat of an invasion by the West. Jacob Zuma himself appeased uh, uh, the, 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 the CCC and recognized it as a political party. Are you friends with Julian Assange? Because my leaks are our guys. Guys... But continue, carry on, carry on, carry on. <laughs> so for me, Cyril Ramaphosa has actually become a radical, much more than all the other South African leaders that were there. That's why when we started this war fighting sanctions, we're very critical of the South African government. But you guys are giving mixed signals. You denounce sanctions on one day, you blame the Zimbabwean government for being incompetent another day. You, you acknowledge that sanctions exist on Zimbabwe, but you say the refugee crisis of uh, refugees being pushed into Zimbabwe is because of human rights violations. All right. Then once it got to a certain level, the moment the UN Human Rights Council released its report saying that sanctions in Zimbabwe were illegal and the South African government completed its own research and they realized that sanctions were a problem, they changed. They changed position. They talked firmly about sanctions being removed. They talked about how they were illegal. 
And they even supported the case that we launched in the South African in the South African courts to push the papers through the Department of International Relations to the U.S. government and to Biden and to push him to respond to our papers. That is a total different change, and it's under Ramaphosa. And since that has happened, since Ramaphosa's position on Russia, since Ramaphosa's position on uh, uh, Zimbabwe, you have seen now that the media is no longer seeing him as a darling. They're beginning to fight him. They're beginning to bring out information about Palapala. They're beginning to bring out information about the fact that there is a ship that came from Russia and loaded arms in South Africa, which I think is nonsense. Russia has one, is one of the most elite weapons production com- countries in the world. It doesn't need South African weapons. It doesn't matter what weapons South Africa can manufacture. Yeah. It doesn't need them because they've got superior weapons. I mean, you think a country with hypersonic missiles, which America doesn't have, is going to be given weapons by South Africa. What kind of weapons? But they're saying that to demonize now Ciro Ramaphosa. Some are even saying that he's been a disappointment. They're even saying that business community doesn't want Ciro Ramaphosa anymore. But so, so okay, tell, t- t- help me figure this out. You mentioned Fili Mbalula and you say that this guy, I actually heard him as... Naito Sega and Tok Funga and Shoti finds the whole of Zim- the whole of Zimbabwe is moved to South Africa. It's like Dim Ruta or other. So like, why is it that the issue of uh, uh, immigration when it comes to Zimbabweans is actually always weaponized when it comes to elections in South Africa? Is it an ANC strategy where they're like, yo, you can't take your anger out on the white man. You might as well take it out on the Nigerians and the Zimbabweans. Look, I actually think South Africa, uh, the ANC actually runs the risk of losing elections next year because they have stopped trying to weaponize um, 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 immigration All right. and they've actually chosen to take sides with Zimbabwe. So when Ciro, when, when Figuil and Balula makes the statements that he makes, they're comical. He's got his way of communication. But what he's saying is that Zimbabweans have been displaced from Zimbabwe into South Africa because of the sanctions that the British and the Americans put on Zimbabwe by not honoring the Lancaster House Conference. That's the words he's saying. All right. Once he acknowledges that the people who are in South Africa from Zimbabwe are displaced peoples. He's actually admitting that they are refugees. He's actually admitting that the crime against humanity of sanctions that deprives them water, healthcare, education, food, jobs, is displacing them into South Africa. He has acknowledged that we are refugees. Yes, there are people who are working. Yes, there are professionals that the South African government itself has courted in, but he's also saying that the helpless people, the people with no skills, who have come into South Africa jumping the border, are displaced refugees. That is no different to the acknowledgement of the refugees that come from Ukraine into the rest of Europe. Now, the South African ANC is taking a risk by accepting and acknowledging that and blaming it on sanctions when everybody else is campaigning by saying, let's deport these These illegal foreigners. So you move... ANC could do that. So It would win elections if it did that. So are you... Who who do you who do who do you lean with? Uh, D A E F F A N C. If you if you say your guys, you you yeah yeah E F F A N C. I support the E F I support the A N C because the A N C is the only reason we've got stability in the region. The day we have a D A government or a D A coalition government with people who hate Africans, like Herman Mashaba, people like um, 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 Gayton McKenzie people who hate Africans and all the other little political parties that are rising up on the ticket of anti-immigration, you're going to put us back into a a pre-1994 position where we're in a cold war with South Africa. With the ANC in power, we don't get into a cold war with South Africa because it is an African government that has interests with the rest of Africa that are aligned, even though we have our little problems. But once we have DA and we have Herman Mashaba and we have EFF tends to sell out sometimes. If they stand with the ANC on a pan-African principle, that's a good government. But if they stand sometimes what they do with the DA on a white supremacist agenda and apartheid agenda, then we're going to war in the region. Yeah. We're going into a cold war. We're going to go back to pre-1994. You're going to see countries like Zimbabwe starting to arm themselves again. You're going to see Botswana, Mozambique, all arming themselves to deal with an apartheid government that's in South Africa that will try to destabilize and be used by the West to try and enforce imperialism in the Southern African region. That's what people don't realize. And black South Africans, when they play with the vote, 
playing around with voting for this uh, DA and its coalitions. They are playing around with the prospect of taking this region into a war like what we have in Ukraine and Russia. Nina uh, Angu personally, Ndofara Alec Macheso, Pani Rume Liri Grano Tawara Soguti, Makasega Machuza, Wondo Nemu, Rero Fungo. Why can you tell South Africans that? Because they look, they, when they look at Zimbabweans, they think that the minute you land by airport, you <laughs> <laughs> drought over Wanda. Like, so, like, what can you warn these guys? Good, like, yo, if they continue on this trajectory, and like, what advice can you give them? To, no, Zimbabweans, yes, they've had the shortages, they've had the cash, whatever, whatever. We've gone through half the battle, right? And they're still having, they're still getting grants. What I say to South Africans is what I say to Zimbabweans that are in the diaspora. A lot of times Zimbabweans in South Africa, Zimbabweans in the UK, people in managerial positions, I'm not talking about the guys at, at the low level, people with businesses in South Africa. When we come back home, our peers, majority of the times, have left us behind. I gave an example last time to say, when I left Zimbabwe to go to South Africa, uh, Kudata Gray was delivering his first 50,000 liters of fuel. He was a nobody, just another manager who had been retrenched from a bank, right. taken his package, taken his pension, was starting a business. And I was in South Africa. At that time, you might say we were at the same level. Kudata Gray, within the time I was in South Africa, 20 years, became a billionaire supplying fuel and becoming the biggest black fuel supplier in Southern Africa. He did it. Just because he stayed in Zimbabwe and took advantage of the opportunity. Scott Sakupuanya was working for Scott McMillan as a gardener when I went into South Africa. And while I was partying, while I was getting money every month, while I had a little car to drive, Scott Sakupuanya turned himself into the biggest gold supplier in Zimbabwe and became a multimillionaire, if not a billionaire. All right? Right? That is the story that is happening at different scalable levels. There are gardeners who came out. Today, they are multimillionaires. They've got four houses, five houses. Because they remained here, took advantage of the gold rush, mined in Zimbabwe, and drew themselves out of poverty. South Africans don't realize that that condition that I'm in, left in mediocrity because of leaving the country to be comfortable, is the condition they are in. In South Africa, it's okay. And most black South Africans, as Zimbabweans were in the diaspora, they have cars, houses, and a minus balance in their bank account. They're still paying off their houses. Very the possible to get a person who at the end of every month gets his salary, the salary goes in. In two days' time after the salary has gone in, he's got a minus 1.2 million rand in his bank account. That doesn't happen in Zimbabwe. In Zimbabwe, I've got an auntie who sells doilies. She comes right. from South Zimbabwe. She goes and sells some stuff in South Africa, comes back. She was robbed by a cousin of mine. 50,000. Hey, that's a brutal family. Go on, they were, tell she's me more. She's got a house that oh, she owns. <laughs> she doesn't have a car, so she's yeah. said to be poor. But she's got a house. She owns it. Cash paid. She had 50,000 rand to be stolen. And at the same time she had that 50,000 rand to be stolen, I didn't even have 2,000 rand. I didn't own my house. I didn't own my car. I didn't even own the cell phone I was using or the, or the, or the fragrance I was putting on my body. It belonged to Edgar's. Now tell me who is who there is in poverty there. You, you see, the problem I have with, with this, 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 this ideology and agenda you're pushing, very noble, right? The problem I have with it is that you're saying that we must be more proud and like stand together as African and kumpaya and like take it, take it up to the man, right? The problem I have is that the people that came before us, the guys that, you know, I mean, I come from, a, like, we're in a continent where the Liberation War heroes, uh, like, give birth to spoiled, and ki spoiled kids that they send to um, private schools. So how do we start this mission and how do we start this agenda where, where we say, okay, we're going in this direction, we need to change the curriculum this way, what should we teach these kids? Because at the end of the day, I mean, yes, me and you can agree here and say, yes, we need to actually stand up for ourselves and be like, and, and be Africans and like, no, what the West is doing is wrong and A, B, C, D. But it seems like the guys that are supposed to be leading the way are actually creating a new breed of this, this entitled little, 
Anyway, continue. <laughs> you know, you know what I, f- I found funny is that when we were growing up, all of us guys were coming from the lower, mi- lower, lower poor middle class. Now you're not poor, Marutino. Come on, you're le- 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 mo- middle, middle class, mo- middle class, <laughs> mid- middle class. Uh, when, when you see, because when when a dean mamuka comes and takes your chick because you can't drive to, to, to the club, it means I'm not married. You're coming from the. From, we used to we call can't it, even buy it. have the Lee Coopers. I remember Lee Cooper those days in the bad <laughs> We can't even afford the Lee Cooper to even show up to go to the club. No, you know. Let me tell you what I've seen. So I came the other time and took a drive to Glenview, Glenora side, to go and see a club there that uh, is called, uh, I think it's, um, what, what is this guy who's got the service stations? Amashwede. Amashwede. Yeah. He's got a little center there. Guys, pay us. Tula Mario Advit. Amashwede, continue. I could not believe the ghetto child and the cars that I saw at Mashwede. All right. These guys are not twanging. They don't speak English. They they speak Masas. And I thought to myself, this never used to happen when I grew up. There were no clubs in the townships for young people. There were shabins and uh, beer halls for Madara. The young people who wanted to party from the ghetto had to go to town, to Agani Center. They had to go to town to go and listen to Raga. They had to go to Tube, uh, to yeah. Tube and so forth. You understand? But now, with the Zimbabwe you guys have built, these kids are now partying. And the parking lots are packed. Can't park cars in the ghetto with ghetto youths driving. Ghetto youths buying bottles of champagne. I never saw that in my time. At the time when Zimbabwe was said to be working, ghetto youths were broke. Ghetto youths had nothing. Now the ghetto youths are driving cars. All right. They're driving cars better than the car I drive. They've got homes. And I'm like, wow, this has changed. But why? Because oh right God. next to that Mashwede, there's a place where they're manufacturing furniture. So the furniture that used to be manufactured by white companies is being manufactured by these ghetto youths. Right. These ghetto youths have got garages that are fixing cars. These ghetto youths are miners. These ghetto youths have got shops. These ghetto youths are selling clothes. The transformation of that economy is something I've never seen before. And they don't get employment from anyone. They create their own employment. That didn't happen during my time. So, the son of a ghetto youthy today is not going to lose Chido because his father doesn't have a car or won't give him a car. They've got cars to give their kids now. Okay. Right? right? Uh, during my time, a Scott Sakpanya would never exist. No, but what I'm saying is that, like, how... So, what do we... No, no, I'm going there. Uh, okay. So, okay. you said now, these guys who are the liberation fighters took their kids to expensive schools, to private schools. And now these kids are neoliberalized. I want to differ with you. Their kids are not neoliberalized. Because when we went to school, we were Benson. They were Anata Kundwa. They were Anata Fadzwa. Right? They had African names. Because these liberation fighters made sure that they had both sides balanced. Go to a private school, learn how the white people do things. But we went to Musha. You're going to the village for your holidays. You're going to... Take a gejo and you're going to plow. You're going to spend all your weekends in the village. So you've got this guy who twangs, this guy who speaks like a like a, like a, like a, like a white boy, but at the same time is very Africanized. And I'll give you a perfect example. My boy, Simba Chitando. All right. When you hear Simba Chitando talking, private school boy went to St. John's, but when you start talking Shona, he'll go in there with you. So last time I said to him, "Hey, you've got that thuggishness going on." It's like, "Hey, I grew up in Zano PF, bro." I would go to a rally in Zengeza, in, 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 in wherever. Okay. Sanu PF oh, is, in touch, is in touch with the people. Okay. And our majority of our people are villagers All right. and people from the townships. I hear you. Right? So this boy went to St. John's, but his dad would not allow him to become aloof. You take him to the rallies, put him in the village, I hear you. put him with the people in the Lokshin, and he had to talk with them. He had to relate with them. So today he's a... Is 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 a is is a diamond well polished that's got all facets. Right. You see, but Isusu, the people who came from waterfalls, the people who came from Mibas. from from, from <laughs> yeah, the, the, the mid, 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 mediocre people, they are the ones that want to throw away the Africanism. All right. So these guys, elites, will always rule us because Junior Mnangagwa is balanced in all ways. 
Kole Numnangagwa is balanced in all ways. The other one even is in the military. So while you guys are soft, he is hardened. He trained with the, with the toughest of the toughest. And he's got that balance of the two. You're not going to compete with a child like that. You're half-baked. You're not even a proper mnoz. <laughs> you, you understand what I'm saying? You don't come from money. You don't know private school life. You don't know the village either. You won't survive with guys like that. That's why they'll continue to rule until you've got that balance. So they are not losing it. And they're not losing the Pan-Africanism. They become sharper, which is why a guy like me, I might not come from that eliteness, but I know that elite life, and I also know how to become a Zimbabwean and an African all at the same time. I become sharper and more difficult to deal with. That's why SABC can't deal with me. That's why uh, 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 702 can't deal with me because I am a double-edged sword because I'm born in both of those. I can relate with the black South African from a township because we've got girls that are coming from those mkukus. We understand what they live. We understand how they survive. And I can also relate to the guys at the top and I can then mix the two to become a hybrid. What's... what's I'm getting to the hybrid. What's the fascination of the West and the British about Zimbabwe? I mean, you got things happening in France. Everywhere else, they don't pay. It's like we're mm -hmm. under a magnifying glass where if anything happens to Zimbabwe, we have to know what's going on. What, like, what's the fascination of the British with Zimbabwe? Because, you know, like, we're, is it because we're the, we're the jewel of Africa or what? What's their fascination with us? Like, not a month goes by without them discussing something Zimbabwean. In, it's like we're a province in the UK, to be, to be honest. We were discussed like in Parliament, UK, like it's clockwork. And you ask yourself, why do they discuss Zimbabwe and not Nigeria, which has got oil? Because if it was about mineral resources or wealth, you would assume that they would look at Nigeria first, criticize Nigeria first. Zimbabwe is the one of the only African countries that defeated white men at war and took its country through war. That's number one. Pretend, I want to beg to push back on that because I've seen people who say, if you defeated this white man, you weren't supposed to go to Lancashire and negotiate. So people say that this guy's bargained. No. Did they bargain we, this we, deal with our boys? Or I should put it to one of them. Because like, that's also, because the history actually distorted. So that's what I need to know. Because like, Van, why can't you say, why can't you go to deal with our boys? This fire. Was it? Jacob, Jacob Zuma explained it perfectly in a video that he makes. That I have seen revolution movements on the African continent. But I have seen what happened in Zimbabwe where white people were defeated to an extent that there were no-go areas and no-go zones for white Rhodesian soldiers who were partnered with the Boers from South Africa. They couldn't go to certain areas of Zimbabwe because they'd been fully liberated by our liberation fighters. When they go there, they died. When they go there, they stepped on mines. When they go there, they drove over mines. They died. And that caused white Rhodesians to start running away from Zimbabwe. There was more migration of white people out of Zimbabwe when we were beginning to win the war than there were white, white people coming into Zimbabwe. The Portuguese were the ones coming in from Mozambique to take their place. But they were running at a faster rate. They even went to recruit mercenaries, 13,000 from the United States, Australia, Canada. The United States government, utilizing its Department of Defense, was the one effectively financing and recruiting mercenaries to come to Rhodesia to protect white supremacy because Rhodesians were running away. Now, people would ask you, why would Rhodesians be running away in a war they are winning? It's because they were losing the war. When you find yourself not able to go to your farms, not able to go to the rural areas because it's become dangerous for you, that shows that you are dying, you are being losing the war. And then the, the, the liberation fighters then had the audacity without tanks, without cars, to come on foot from Mozambique into Rhodesia, into Salisbury, and to bomb their fuel, strategic fuel reserves. That the army didn't have fuel anymore. They didn't have fuel for their planes because they were bombed here in Workington. That's when they realized that we've lost the war. Because how are you going to defend the country when you don't have fuel? How are you going to fuel your choppers and your jets with no fuel? At that point, the British government and the American government with Kissinger and Wooster in South Africa began to put pressure on Kaunda in Zambia and uh, 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 Samora Michelle in Mozambique to say, right, you guys have to push these people to go into negotiations. And why did they pressure them? They pressured them because Zambia did not have a way to port to Durban. 
because Rhodesia was closed, it was forced to be closed because of the sanctions on by the UN. Oh, yeah. Mozambique used to make its money from the pipeline and the railway line that took our exports to port. Now, once they instituted the UN sanctions, they were no longer making money from that. So their countries were starving. Remember, they just also got in their independence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So once they were countries were starving, they went to the UN and were crying to say, you said we must close our borders. So you must give us money so to sustain feed, our country. Feed off our people, and yeah. in the UN, who are the people who veto and have the powers? Is the UN Security Council. The Americans would veto any packages to be given to Zambia and Mozambique. So these countries were starving because of supporting us in the war. So the Americans, Kissinger, went and said, if you want us to give you the packages to resuscitate your economies because of the sanctions you have on Rhodesia, force the liberation fighters in your countries to go to Switzerland to negotiate and then to Lancaster House. Why? Because we want a negotiated settlement so that our whites do not lose their properties, do not lose the land, do not lose their farms, do not lose their, what you call it, their factories. So we want a negotiated settlement. So they were okay. pressured okay. Okay. into I that guess, negotiation. You. you see what I'm saying? Why? Because they knew that they allowed the war to go on for another six months. Europeans were going to be murdered and killed in the streets. So, and they were going to have to run away from this country, leaving their cars, their houses, and their farms. So why, what, what's the fascination with Zimbabwe? Like everyone around... So, so, so you defeat Europeans. And yet Kissinger had written a document called NSSM 32, 39, that said, under no circumstances... Should Africans be allowed to defeat a white man on African soil because it will radicalize Africans and begin to push them to defeat Europeans everywhere on the continent, particularly in South Africa? So they could not allow that, and Zimbabwe did that. Then number two, you are the center of what is called the, 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 the Persian Gulf of strategic mineral resources. The most important mineral resources for for fueling industry and the military industrial complex come from Southern Africa. These are nickel, uh, the platinum group metals, uh, the rhodium, uh, um, uh, 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 manganese, um, and uh, cobalt, copper, and uh, and majority of these are coming from Zimbabwe. Okay. Now we've got lithium. These are the new strategic mineral resources. So this present Gulf of Strategic Mineral Resources, America created the document NSSM uh, 39 to push their government to control Southern Africa for these resources that are important for industry and the military industrial complex. And they said, if we lose control of that to the Russians or the Chinese, then we'll be defeated ultimately, militarily and industrially. So you have to control that region. But to control that region is going to be difficult when there's a Zimbabwe there. That when you go and you put rebels in Mozambique, they send their army. And the army, yeah, yeah, yeah. When you go to the DRC and you want to get the cobalt and the coltan and you want to use uh, Rwanda and uh, 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 Uganda to take the mineral resources for the West alone, Zimbabwe sends its soldiers there, kicks ass again. Zimbabwe became a problem for that particular reason. Then there is the spiritual aspect. Zimbabwe is said by people to be one of the most spiritual places on earth because there are vortices that are found. Now, I don't really want to go into that spiritual aspect, but... Tipe Papa, Tipe Papa. <laughs> <laughs> and that is why even the liberation struggle itself was not won because of the just the technical superiority of our I, I, fighters. I've, I've it was a lot. fought from a spiritual perspective where esoteric things and uh, 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 metaphysical things happened win that war. The Europeans, they witnessed that defeat and they witnessed these spiritual activities that defeated them. And they cannot stand for Zimbabwe to continue to be independent because it can teach the rest of Africa how to do that. Okay, so why? And then lastly, let me, oh, yeah. I, 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 I can't leave this one out. So now then you guys have got this defeating white people, then you de begin to take your land. Taking your land reverses the most strongest principle that has maintained colonialism, which is the doctrine of discovery. 1454, a pope said to Europeans, you are killing yourselves here. You've eaten your animals, you've finished your animals, 
You have de de depleted the resources. Now you can't survive, so you're at war all the time, killing each other. Go out and look for new lands. And any land you get where there are non-Christians, where there are non-Europeans, conquer it because those people are half human and you can take the property because it's not owned or occupied. And you must do this into perpetuity forever and enslave those people forever for Europeans to continue to flourish. Zimbabwe then goes to war with these Europeans, the same settlers who got this decree, the same settlers who made a covenant to this agreement. You come, you defeat them. After you defeat them, you then take the land that they got, the property rights that Europeans said were theirs, then you them kick them out. And then you set a precedence that now tells the American Indian that the land that the Americans have built on is not American land, it's not white land, it's yours. You are telling the Australians who have killed the Aboriginals, to tell the Aboriginals that that land that is Australia is yours. Take it. That is what the Europeans are also fighting to say. If Zimbabwe stands, it then means the emancipation of natives is legitimate and everyone else should follow suit. South Africa being the first, Namibia being the next, and ultimately the American Indian the, 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 the Australian, and so forth and so on. That is a threat to the white supremacist order. What's your, what's your take on what happened in Botswana where those guys are, are entering into an agreement that the beers with our boys? That it, like, do you think a 50-50 split is actually even reasonable? What I, like about, what I like about Masisi is that he's uh, pushing the envelope. And my problem with him is he believes that De Beers is the only country company that should mine those diamonds. And the reason he believes that is because DBS controls global diamond market through the central selling organization. But I believe that Masisi should have done what we've done here, indigenize, kick DBS out and get Botswana companies to mine. Because the biggest miners of diamonds are Botswana, followed by Russia. If we decide to say that we must now create a new organization that is not imperialist like DBS, where are they going to get their diamonds from? The biggest buyers of diamonds are no longer the Americans, it's the Chinese through Shao Tai Fuk. So why are we still worried about the BS? That's where Masisi got it wrong for me. But I understand him trying to do this in stages. Because eventually he's going to push the BS to a point where they cannot accept the deal and they will leave. Currently he's giving them enough for them to survive and prof to remain profitable for them to do business with him. But uh, I understand that uh, diamonds are their biggest uh, revenue earner. So he's scared to mess around with that because it will be a shock attack for uh, Botswana if the DBS pulls out and the sanctions come onto Botswana. So, but I think he should be more radical. Cha, I'm going to ask a very personal question, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, all the Junizanotaora is Junizan Nochki side is in Orai So, is there some espionage mission going on? Are you a KGB agent? Are you CIA? Are you CIA? <laughs> <laughs> Like, aren't you scared, though? Like, on a, on a, on a very real... Um, uh, aren't you scared of some of this information that you you, you know what? You know, like, you, you never win with... It. Not that you never win, but I'm saying, you know, it doesn't end well with people who actually say the things that you say. Scary conversations that... Can you see the crew is silent right now? I found out Roche got in us in the tail, but aren't you scared though? And who's and and and, and I'll be upfront with you because I want this to be because it's a bold exchange and it's an honest uh, exchange. Whose bidding are you doing? Look, I'm already dead when I live in a country with no freedom because of sanctions. I'm already dead when I'm a race that has no self determination. I'm already dead if I'm living on a continent where we actually do not govern ourselves. I'm dead. So I have no fear to die again because I'm already dead. That, that's 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 your like your I have a dream. I so in, whatever happens to you, right? It's, it's, that's that's your I have a dream moment. And, and I the really... good thing is that if anybody killed me, I become a martyr, and everything I've said and everything I've done will become bigger and magnified than it is now. They'll be doing me a favor because my message will now spread, and hopefully it'll start to change the next generation. But what I cannot do is to live as a man. With, the, with my tail between my legs. When I'm already coming from a race that is subjugated, yet there are people who fought slavery and succeeded. And many people say, we never fought slavery. Slavery was defeated by um, the abolitionists in uh, Europe. No, Haiti defeated France. It defeated Napoleon. And Napoleon was then defeated in Europe because of his defeat in Haiti. 
the British only succeeded at Waterloo because of what had been happened to uh, Napoleon in Haiti. Now, if the Haitians could do that when it was unfashionable to fight whites, they could defeat them. And if the, J the J Jamaican Maroons were able to force the British to form a, 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 a pact or a treaty in 1739, because they'd been defeated by the Maroons, who were slaves that were brought on ships, they got to, 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 to Jamaica, they ran away, lived in the bushes, and they began a guerrilla warfare of killing British soldiers until the British said, whoa, 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 we're not going to enslave you. Let's have a treaty. If they could do that then. Why are we scared? Okay. To a simple mind, right, to an ordinary Joe on the street, why is your cause important, the Zimbabwe anti sanctions movement? Like, why is that important? Because, like, people, you know, like, you walk around and people tell you that, yo, they don't experience sanctions. I experience sanctions and I can't do business. No, I'm being for real. Like, I can't contribute to Getty Images. I mean, there are a lot of other platforms that I can actually get yeah. and, and get a fair shot at, like, yeah. it, it putting my, my 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 craft out there, um, and then people say no, I'm and I'm not even like a cancer like my so I don't know whether we share for Angu Rupab, but I know I feel the pinch. There's some payment facilities that I can't even like do because I'm in uh, I'm in Zim. To a layman on the street, Munarugum Sika, Munarugu, Arugu Zumba Maramba Fungwa. I should have used a better example, but anyway, how do they? How do you explain what's going on? Right, very good question. So when we were living under colonialism, they were subjecting us with the guns. They were subjecting us with baton sticks and tear gas. That's how they were subjugating us. And they would also subjugate us by making sure we don't go to school. We cannot go into university. We cannot go to do O levels. We cannot do A levels so that we remain farm workers and mine workers. And then they would pay us peanuts and low salaries, right? And they did that to control us. Now they're doing exactly the same thing, but they're no longer utilizing tear gas. They're no longer utilizing baton sticks. They're no longer utilizing uh, their police to subjugate us because we defeated them. They are now using other means. The other means now are they are now going into our economy and banning our banks from other banks so they cannot borrow money from international banks in terms of foreign currency to give locally to our businesses, to give to our government so that it can build hospitals, so it can build schools, so that it can build uh, infrastructure. So the black man is still being deprived of that education by them depriving our government the loans to be able to build. Why does our government need loans? Because we took over a broke country, a country where they've taken all the easy-to-reach gold, all the easy-to-reach platinum, all the easy-to-reach coal, and they left us a debt of 700 million, which is 2.8 billion today. So we had nothing because they stole it all. And remember, Rhodesia was built off the cows that were stolen from our forefathers. And our cows were our bank. It was built off the taxes that were collected from the hut tax, the bicycle tax, the wife tax, the cat tax, the dog tax, that was collected from our, 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 our forefathers. And when I calculate what we lost in Rhodesia, this country in 90 years lost over 1.8 trillion US dollars, wealth that should be Zimbabwean wealth that is not there today. We were supposed to rebuild this country that was robbed of so much money. And now we are struggling to build that. That is sanctions and what they do. They take that legacy of deprivation from colonialism, that button stick that used to stop our grandfathers from getting good jobs. So now you are your grandfather's pensions. Many people are their parents' pensions because the jobs that they used to work are destroyed. Their pensions were eroded. Sanctions make sure that you inherit the colonial legacy that you have to look after your grandfather, then you look after your parents, then you must build up your own life. In a country in which can't have industry because there's no loans, in a country where you can't start a business because there's no loans, in a country that there's no infrastructure because the taxes are less because the companies have been reduced. So we are all affected by our government being put under colonial conditions <coughs> on a global level. What do you say to people who push back to that point um, and say... Yes, we're a wealthy country. Because in, it, personally, right, I personally believe that we are a very wealthy country. And what do you say to people who then say that, yo, yes, we understand sanctions are there, they're bad. But one of the major contributing factors is misgovernance and corruption. What do you say to, to people who say that? The first thing I say to them is that 
there's already been studies that were done to prove what the problem in Zimbabwe is. The UN did its study for 12 months. The South African government did its study for 24 months. All of them came up with conclusions that sanctions were the problem in Zimbabwe. How do we know this? Because before 2000, when the sanctions were imposed, <laughs> Zimbabwe was the country with the second biggest stock exchange in Africa after South Africa's stock exchange. Under ZANO-PF, in 1990, 1997, we had the second biggest stock exchange on the African continent. We had the most profitable stock exchange on the African continent and one of the most profitable in the world in 1997 under ZANO-PF. We had the most educated people on the African continent in Zimbabwe under ZANO-PF in 1997, 1998, 2000. We had the best army on the African continent that had fought the most wars and successfully uh, been a victor in those wars and fought wars to protect other nations. We had a, an education system and, and a, a healthcare system that made people leave Botswana to come for healthcare and education here. It made people leave Angola to come for healthcare and education here. It even made the black South Africans leave South Africa to come for education and healthcare here. Until 2000 when the sanctions started. So how come this ZANOPF was able to run one of the best countries in Africa for 20 years under independence and only starts having problems under sanctions? And even under sanctions... Zimbabwe still treats HIV better than South Africa. It still treated COVID better than South Africa, that South Africans were migrating from South Africa to come and get uh, vaccinations in Zimbabwe. We treat TB better than all the countries in this region to the extent that we're the only country in Africa that was removed from the TB list of most vulnerable countries to TB in 2021, uh, and no other country was removed from there. Why is that happening? If Zimbabwe has got this incompetence, why would we still be the most educated nation on the continent and best in STEM, I, better than countries without sanctions, if it's true? Because it's not true. So it is a lie. It's a stereotype. But that stereotype needs to be looked at to say, how do you expect the resources of this wealthy country to be leveraged if there's no capital? And when we have struggled to create a capital class in 20 years, the moment Tagure is able to finance mining, the moment he becomes the biggest gold miner, the moment Scott Sakpwanya is the biggest gold supplier, the moment Radland raises up to be the biggest tobacco producing company in Africa and is now also the biggest producer of sugar and wanted to buy the South African sugar company and the South Africans closed him down to stop Zimbabweans from being bigger than South Africans. If then when these men rise up, and have created enough capital, and they are about to fund the banking system and the manufacturing to leverage these resources, the Americans come and sanction them. The Americans come and create a, a, a gold mafia so that they can uh, block their accounts in South Africa and Dubai for being money launderers. They, they're destroying this class of people that has been risen over 20 years to now start financing the leveraging of these resources. How are we going to leverage these resources? We, we broke our gold production uh, 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 um, uh, record. Record, yeah, for... Uh, of all time. Yeah. Last year. It was not funded by banks. There is no JP Morgan there. There is no BlackRock there. There is no Merrill Lynch. It's funded by Zimbabweans. We've got Liquid, Liquid Telecom. Liquid Telecom is a, the biggest fiber company in Africa, based in South Africa, but it was funded by Econet investors who are Zimbabweans. Tell me, which other country can do that? South Africa, everything is funded by BlackRock, Vanguard, Fidelity. All their banks are owned by these American I, institutions. I, 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 like what, I like what you said, and there's, there's a question I actually want to ask, which is like, what's your take on, you, you, know, you know this history of these business guys when they were young investors that the government gave money, but now... Well, Kuram Soro and they're always bad mouth in the government. What's your take on that? I think that's a very, that, I think that's treasonous what they're doing. I, I mean, you know some of the names, well, for yeah, for security. I, but I mean, these guys yeah. were funded by the government for the past, and then when their autobiography come, they're out here saying, "No, I started with a toothpick. Now I've got a restaurant." And they don't tell the story that they're being funded by, and they're telling you you must pray hard. They always tell you the I walked 23 kilometers on barefoot, <laughs> but they won't tell you that at a time when I was struggling in business, the government of Zimbabwe came through. And um, what what do you say to that? Yeah. Um, the government of Zimbabwe is on record of having spent $7 billion funding 
the uh, organizations that were involved in affirmative action. These include IBDC and uh, what do we call it, the other one, uh, uh, Affirmative Action yeah. Group, right? And these guys were given monies to start tracking companies. They were given tenders. Um, we've got one businessman who now calls himself a British billionaire. He was actually given tenders from putting electricity at Mugabe's house, putting electricity at the, uh, uh, what do you call that uh, stadium? The, uh, the National Sports Stadium. Uh, the Sp National Sports Stadium, yes. All those little yeah, yeah, yeah. houses that you do the payments at. He's the one who electrified them. He was given that contract by Leo Mugabe without a bidding process because he has been giving pre preferential treatment to start these businesses. Today, he's a British billionaire, yet he was made by Zimbabwe. He's a bad mouther of the Zimbabwean government, yet he was made by Zimbabwe. When his, uh, one of his telecommunications companies got its uh, license, the license was given irregularly. The judges were paid by a woman who came from America, who came to bribe judges to give a license when she was supposed to, when the court was supposed to give a decision to reverse the bidding process and to have a rebid where there were six other companies that were way much better than the company that eventually got the license. But that person doesn't admit that they were made by the government of Zimbabwe. However, having said that there are many business people who were made in that period who do give credit to the government of Zimbabwe. Some of them don't speak, but they do not badmouth their government. And they've stayed in this country. They've reinvested their monies. Someone like Philip Chiangwa, he was made by affirmative action. Not a day has he lived outside Zimbabwe. He lives here. He invests in properties here. He buys his properties here. He creates jobs here. There are many others like him. Shingim Tasa. He could have gone to live anywhere in the world. He's continued to live here. Those are empowerment products. But now what, what sometimes affects me is some of these empowerment guys are now bitter at another generation of uh, business people who came after them, people like Kuda Taguri. Kuda is hated not only by normal Zimbabweans, but he's also hated even by his peers who got empowerment and never made it as big as Kuda. But Kuda didn't get the same empowerment. Yes, he benefited from the sanctions that had pulled out uh, BP, Shell, but he couldn't even get a license to sell fuel. The 149 licenses that were given... He didn't get one of those. He had to go to a person who got a license and he had to beg for that person to allow him to use his license. Then he became a multi-billionaire without assistance or without as much assistance from government because he's gotten contracts, he gets jobs, but that's because he had proved his worth. And when he comes up, we had fuel shortages for close to 16 years. Yet the people who were empowered by, 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 by the government were there. They were eating their money alone. Then Kuda comes, starts providing fuel, fuel cues are gone. It, 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 it's, it's really sad. It takes a white man like Radland to invest in agriculture and uh, 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 tobacco production as the biggest uh, contract farmer uh, financer and the biggest user of that tobacco to make gold leaf the biggest production company of tobacco in Africa even more than BAT. They kicked BAT from the top. And today he's being attacked for that. But don't black, our, some of our black indigenous business people feel ashamed that it's now taking a white Zimbabwe to yes, be yes, more I'm... patriotic to funding and driving gold production, eh, 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 tobacco production in this country, yet he never got indigenized. Is that the problem you have with, because, you know, um, um, is that the problem you have with the other gentlemen who's always who's treating from somewhere in, uh, there in Grayson? Is that the problem you have? Because my, because he then always then says that as much as we're saying this has happened, there's corruption in this country. Big ruguru on Zimbabwe. You already believe there's corruption. <laughs> there is corruption. This is a capitalist system. In capitalism, you make money by taking factors of production and putting it into the hands of a few so that they can make money and they can use others as labor. And others are deprived of opportunities to make money so that they can be laborers. That's can how say, capitalism can, can, works. Can you say it again? I like the way how you, you, you made uh, corruption look nice there. I'm it's not really making it look nice. <laughs> it's just right. So, so, so capital, capitalism is about taking factors of production of public goods, oh, yeah. be it mining rights, be it the spectrum that is used for cellular networks, yeah. taking it from everybody and then giving it preferentially 
to somebody who is connected politically, who's got an education, and saying, utilize it and make money. And we deprive everybody else of the same license. We deprive everybody else of the same right to mine or do anything so that you can make money. And we're depriving these ones so that they don't have jobs. And when they don't have jobs, they get hungry. And they've got no other way to feed themselves but to work for you. That's how you keep create capitalism. That's corruption in essence. All right. Right? So you cannot have a country and an economy without corruption when it is based on a capitalist system that is corruption in nature. If you want to end corruption, then change the system. Refuse to be a capitalist society as Zimbabweans. And you have got Zimbabweans who are quick to point about corruption. You say, when, where you've got a house, you've got title deeds on. Where did you get the house? If you're in Harare, where did you get your house? Oh, I got my house because I bought it. Bought it from where? Because this land was Chief Mbari's land. Did you compensate Chief Mbari? Did you buy your property from Chief Mbari? No. You bought it from the city of Harare. The city of Harare was a continuation of the city of Salisbury that stole land from people. And you never compensated the owners of that land. But you have got a property, of stolen property, and you want to tell us that you are not corrupt. You are the worst kind of corruption. I but come on, Rutendo, you're, you're reaching on that one. I mean, I, you can't blame me. And I was I mean, come on now. What does the law say about buying stolen property? I, 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 just wanted, I just want us to talk about the legal issues. If you are found with a stolen phone, what happens to you with the ZRP? But what I'm saying is this. No, no, no. Don't rush. <laughs> so once you have agreed that if you are found in possession with stolen property, you are a criminal yourself. We have to admit, guys, that all the properties that we have afforded to buy now because of being part of this corrupt capitalist system, we, are, we have bought stolen property. We have bought in public goods, which we have appropriated for our own benefit and we are enjoying the benefits. You're no different from the ZANU PF official who got land from land reform. In fact, the ZANU PF official who got land from land reform is better than you because land reform took place. Land was brought back, although it wasn't returned to Chief Mbari. And then they divided that land again to people. I, I, I hear you. And, you know, uh, speaking of Harare, I'm always seeing, you know, as, as in my uh, cousin's place, you know, she's got a, sorry to say, but hey, the my niece is a bit, you know, chubby on the chubby end. And and then that got me thinking, you know, like, I was just thinking, I was like, yo, I'm going to wait here. And, you know, these days when I don't go, you know, my cancer, cancer. And I was in my theater the other time. And he called, there is like, um, Utalat Nagasville, like a cast, I said, you know, the, the, Amakomani and stuff will just, uh, open them up, get the seed out, and put it dried up in the next season, and you you then realize that yo this shibage we we're, we're eating is becoming tasteless. Everything these tomatoes are just becoming too perfect. You know, like they just like and what's going on with the food that we're eating? Like like even the the beef yasho aichizi why go yangos ma bachi you know you know i mean like what 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 what's happening when it comes to the food that we're consuming because i was actually thinking about even your rice yasho ma you know it's like it's like the 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 the, the, the new war is like like what's going on there what 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 hurts me is that um zimbabweans used to be particular about food it was a spiritual Counter. It was the most important ritual that we undertake. It didn't matter how rich you were, but food had to be quality. But all of a sudden, we don't care anymore. And you realize that sanctions had a great part to play in the aspect that when we became a hungry nation, our farmers were not producing as much as because we were still in the evolution of <laughs> recreating these farms. We started eating stuff from South Africa and we got used to it. Yeah, I always tell people that there is nothing like my too many noodles or rice or not a dollar. There is no way you can afford all those costs to farm it and get it a dollar, guys. That's right. So, so, so now what has happened is Zimbabweans don't appreciate food anymore. So they allow this tasteless, nasty-tasting food to, 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 to be eaten. But they have, we are losing our competitive advantage. Zimbabwe's beef was world-renowned because of its taste. Same as our chicken. That is where we should have built our competitive advantage. 
so that we can sell our beef and our chicken to those who can afford it at the highest possible price. Because like champagne, which is branded from yeah, France. From France, yeah, yeah. Yes, we should have branded our beef. We should have branded our chicken. We should have branded our, 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 our guinea fowls. But we have got this tendency of copying everything that we see. We've decided not to be a niche and decided to be a low-cost leader. We are competing with South Africa to produce junk food at the cheapest possible price. Come on. And it's important for us. It's important. My GMO, my GMO are not been on 2008. Yes, but those were not our GMOs. Now we are producing GMOs in Zimbabwe. We are importing GMOs. You don't eat GMO. I don't eat GMO. So one of the things I do in South Africa is I, I sell game meat. I sell goat meat. If I do sell beef, I have to be getting it from a producer who produces certified non-GMO. And we're now able to get better tasting beef and better tasting chicken and better tasting pigeon, better tasting game in South Africa because they are realizing the problem of this cheap food production that's giving cancers, but it tastes bad. In Zimbabwe now, we're coping what the South Africans are trying to run away from. Yet we used to have superior food on the continent. The problem also lies in government. Ah, sure, sure. No, no, but no, it is in, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Listen, there was a problem. There was a drought. These guys are, came out and were giving out solutions. Listen. So I don't, I, don't, I don't have a problem with someone who is like saying, yo, listen, not that I'm saying what they are doing is wrong or their agenda is right. But what I'm saying is if someone comes with a solution and says, listen, guys, whatever is happening, like you, I mean... Is, is not right, and then they come up with an alternative. You can't actually vilify them. They never invented GMO. They just go in with the flow. They've got to get things right now. And the only way they can get things right now is to get criticism now, constructive criticism. Right now, like I'm saying, Radland has taken over sugar because Zimbabwe's sugar is a higher quality sugar than the one in South Africa. Radland has taken over cigarettes because Zimbabwean cigarettes and tobacco is the best in the world. If you start doing to tobacco what it is that they're doing to animal feed, if you start doing to tobacco what they're doing with maize, you are then going to have Zimbabwe not taking that position that Radland has taken. But what's the, why, 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 why attack the seed? Why attack the seed? Because, I mean, they're, they're trying to patent these, these new seeds. They're trying to change our seed. Like, and, you know, one thing I really commend the, 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 the government of this country is they've tried as hard as... Um, as possible to actually protect that field of the seed. Why should we attack the seed? No, the government has not protected the seed. That's why right now Seedco is producing hybrids that have taken over entire Zimbabwean farming chain. Yet that 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 hybrid, when you put it in the soil and it grows, it cannot be replanted again and again and again forever. It stops reproducing at some point. A hybrid seed, not a GMO seed, a hybrid seed. Number two, a hybrid seed grows quickly and grows bigger because of hybrid vigor. That hybrid vigor then attenuates the nutritional value of the seed. It has been scientifically determined by many experiments that a hybrid seed produces a, a fruit or leaves that is sometimes up to 80% less nutritional value. So that is why people are no longer being healed by the food. That is why they are sickly, because their food has got 80% less nutritional value of the most important nutrients. And that is what we're eating in Zimbabwe. And it is coming from a company that is in Zimbabwe that is endorsed by the government. And we're saying, go back to open pollinated variety seeds. Because the, the hybrid, once you put it in the ground and it grows quickly, it does not adapt with climate because that seed has no continuity. Use it one season, next season, third season, it's no longer. Yeah. So you have to go and rebuy. So this seed never gets to learn the climate change, the diseases, yeah, to adapt. Yeah, yeah, to adapt, yeah, it's always. But yet the one that your grandmother used, you put it in the ground, next year it comes out. When there's a drought, 10, 90% of them die, 10% live. That 10% that has lived is usually drought resistant. You keep it, you, know, you no, reuse yeah. it. There's a locust, it comes. There's some that are going to survive the locust. Those ones are adapted. And you continue to do that, you create an heirloom seed over 100 years. That seed is more stronger, more virile, and adapted to the climate conditions of the area. That's why it's called an heirloom seed. We've eliminated heirlooms. If you look at the... You remember the matabili, or matabili that we used to eat when we were kids? Yeah. It was munga. Yeah. yeah. It's a sweet smell. When was the last time you ate munga with a sweet smell? 
in the, I even sometimes I even doubt who in Rujiga Munga Chai. That's right. Yeah. Because they've destroyed the seed by hybridization. What's the bigger picture there? The bigger picture is to go back to OPVs. Now, one thing you said is true. I was speaking to a gentleman uh, from the government who I love so much. And he said, you know what? We might be having all these hybrids, but we've got every single original seed that we use to create those hybrids. And we have got the process by which these hybrids were created. We document that scientifically. So that when need be, we can take these seeds or their original and restart a new seed bank. That is what I like about what government has done. But this is why I was critical of government. Say, government, I know you've got a technician and a technical person like John Basera, who is increased production in Zimbabwe. But my issue with John is John comes from Seedco. He probably still has shares within Seedco. He still has probably still has share options. What are the chances that when he's in our government, he's making a decision that is going to help us in the long term, not short term, because short term is producing. You can't fault John's numbers. But can it be sustainable? Because this Seedco, it's big, one of its biggest shareholders was a comp- company called Belmorin. What are those Russians? Filmorin is Chinese. I mean, it's it's French. French, yeah. And Filmorin was responsible for eliminating tomato seeds in Europe because they are the biggest vegetable seed producer in the world. And when they were doing that, they eliminated the heirloom seeds of tomatoes in Europe, 360 varieties by hybridization. Wow. And then when they got to the point where Europe no longer had original tomato seeds, they began to sell the very same hybrids at prices up to 400,000 euros a kg. From 60,000 euros to 400,000 euros a kg is what they sell their seeds at. Wow. Now tell me, in a poor country or an African country, if they start selling you seeds, maize seeds, sorghum seeds, because they've eliminated the originals and they only now have seeds that don't reproduce, and they now sell them to you at 400 euros a kg, 400,000 euros a kg. Already Where the, are you going to find the money when it costs more than gold for that seed? Already, already the seed now, prices... Now, two, seed two prices, seconds, two right. seconds. And the reason why this has to be said is that the government of Zimbabwe itself and Seedco must sit and relook at the strategy for Africa forward. Otherwise, we're going to be re-enslaved by food in a slavery we can never come out of. And and yeah, because the seed pricing is actually quite uh, it's, it's 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 getting more expensive to actually buy seed and just to to add. So how do we preserve the seed and just to add on that? So how and also are we on the right track as as, as a country as Zimbabwe? Are we on the right track? Are we are we on a trajectory to prosperity or it's all doom and gloom? And are we on the right track to train uh, to the African agenda of two thousand and sixty three? It's a mixed it's a mixed bag. When it comes to mining, we're beginning to get mining right. Are producing on the mines, we are funding our own mines. The gold is funded, the gold rush is funding itself, it's also funding other industries. So we're getting to a point where Zimbabweans are making money. Sadly, some a lot of the money is in people's wardrobes and people's vaults. We have to now find a way to get that money out of the vaults, invested into the economy, and confidence to invest it back into the banking system. But there's problems there too. The mining is unsustainable, people are destroying the environment. So we need to make sure that we get our mining to be environmentally friendly. For it to be what? The word I used again, sustainable, sustainable for, yeah. the future. for the future. Yeah. Right. Agriculture, we're beginning to get our numbers. Wheat is coming up. Uh, maize is coming up. Tobacco, we are done. But do we control the seeds? Do we contr- Are we putting fertilizers that kill the soil so that in another 10 years' time, 20 years' time, these soils are dead and we're relying on fertilizers from America again? We need to use sustainable fertilizers. In Zimbabwe, we've got guano. Let's use guano. Let's use organic fertilizers that make our soils living soils that are going to live longer. Uh, let's have our own seeds. Let's leave these hybrids. Let's leave this technology and patent the technology uh, for depending on our food production. I know the good thing about Seedco is they say Seedco is a Zimbabwean company because it didn't join Seedco International, which was supposed to make it a, 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 a hybrid to, to, to no, change no. the seed. They're already changing the seed, right. but it was going to be owned. Why are they changing the seed? Is it capitalism? They say that they're exchanging the seed to make it produce more and to put in traits like uh, disease resistance and and, and uh, resistance to pests. But Do we you say, trust those guys? We're saying, no, I don't. 
I don't know. I don't like. Know. And they're, they're, they're a, com- a private company's uh, 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 objective is profit for its shareholders. It doesn't care about anything else. That's the threat. And I'm saying, government, your, 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 your objective as a government is to care for your people first. The two don't mix. So we need to find a way to make sure that these two uh, 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 interests that are opposed find a way of meeting. And coexist in, and co-exist. in, in, in a very... Uh, and it should be about making sure that Zimbabwe is sustainable long-term, not the short-term. And there's... There seems to be this global uh, narrative and agenda that's being pushed um, of the guys with the flags and the alphabets and whatever, whatever. And the this propaganda against Africa is always against Africa. Why is that so? And what's going on? What's what's going on in the world? It's a crazy world we live in right now. And the what, Americans are using the Ukrainians to fight that war. And uh, they are hoping to take territory in Europe and to surround uh, Russia so that ultimately they can uh, annihilate Russia. And Russia has every reason to defend itself and protect itself. And for the rest of the world, that is not neoliberal. For the bottom of the capitalist pyramid where the exploitation happens, and that's in Africa and Asia, we need to stand up with Russia because Russia is the only alternative to neutralize American unilateralism. If you remember, when Russia fell, the very first thing that the Americans did the moment that uh, uh, Russia fell yeah. is they went to attack Iraq. They wouldn't have attacked Iraq had Russia still been there and strong. They went to attack Libya. They went to attack Afghanistan. They went to attack Somalia. They did the Arab Spring. They did that because there was no counter to their power and their military. No one, no one could check them and say, no guys, you, 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 you're, taking, you're stepping out of line. The agenda that you are talking about right now, the flag, the, 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 the color flags agenda, uh, the LGBTQ uh, agenda, it's now being made a mainstream agenda in which everybody is being forced to adopt it only because America had primacy and power in the, in a, in a unipolar world. Now, I need to make this clear. I don't care what people do in their bedrooms. And I think that the Zimbabwean government for many years has known that there were activities happening in people's bedrooms that were not necessarily in our value system, but it didn't care because it was happening behind closed doors. However, the problem now is that this agenda is being fed to our children and being fed to the country so that it ceases to be a choice, but it now becomes something that is being pushed to you. That's my only problem. Let those who have those sexual preferences be what they are without it being imposed on everybody else and let them do it in their bedrooms. In the same way, heterosexuals themselves must not go around having their heterosexual sex in Every public, public yeah, for yeah, other yeah. people to see. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's how I feel. Mm-hmm. On that. What's the future of education in Africa? What, what's that, what does that look like? The future leaders and stuff like what's the future of... Of of um of education. What's a current? What's what should be? I mean, I mean, I don't I don't understand why I'm being force fed to read about King something something that happened or Hitler. I honestly, yo, I got my own struggles. But like, why is my kid being subjected to that kind of education? Like, why is it? Why is this in the curriculum? Why are you not saying goodie? Like, why isn't? Why aren't you talking about how you invaded my people and killed my people? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But you say so. Like, what's the future of education in Africa? I think Dokora had a, a very good idea about what education needs to be. Because, like he was saying, that uh, we need to create an education system that's going to empower Zimbabweans for the new world. They need to know how to work industry. They need to know how to create things in industry. And I'm understanding that when you see students who come from NAST, they are on another level. There was a guy who was telling me about uh, software that they created here in Zimbabwe and they took it to South Africa and it is being used in South Africa now and they're making money from it and it was created by kids from NAST. Wow. So we need more of that. But Zimbabwe has had one problem and it has always had that problem of focusing on STEM and thinking that STEM and uh, commercial subjects are the most important. So we lack creative. All right. And we don't own a creative. That's why we're weak at communication. That's why we don't have advertising agency, communication agencies, and we don't have production houses 
because in this country it's not seen as being educated. But then you have the gold mafias and negative publicity continuing to destroy the image of Zimbabwe and no one to counter that because you don't have artists who can create content and create a, a, in, a, you know, captivating content to counter what it is that the world that treasures STEM and arts is producing. So we need an education system that's going to give full balance to arts together with STEM and together with commercial subjects to build something that is holistic. Otherwise, you're going to always have a society that is the way it is. We must stop competing in schools. This number one culture, I want to be number one, has made us very, very, very self-centered. It has made us selfish. It made us unable to collaborate where building a country is a team sport. We can't play as teams as Zimbabweans. We're individualistic well, it, and we pull each other down. I actually agree with you because, you know, it's... I don't know that's the perspective because to be honest with you, right? I believe we all love Zimbabwe. But Kalav, Kajo, Kamakari Toxic, so it's like from different uh, spectrums. Um, so say I've never been to Zimbabwe, I just learned it from Planet Moon. What would you what are the five things that you tell the world about Zimbabwe? Very briefly, like tell me like what's the most amazing things about Zimbabwe and why people should come visit Zimbabwe, invest in Zimbabwe. And before you go, and I just need to say for the record, Zimbabweans don't love Zimbabwe. We were raised to hate our country. That's why we always need to migrate. That's why we always need something that's... <laughs> <not> <laughs> <made>. <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> the, the, which is brilliant. And that's why we badmouth our country. But there are some who really love their country. Hence, you had our forefathers going to fight for the country. Uh, if I was to tell people five things that are great about Zimbabwe, the human talent, the spirit of the Zimbabwean people is an amazing spirit. It's a creative spirit. It is a productive spirit. It just needs to be channeled properly and it can do amazing things and miracles. And it just has to be made to believe in itself. Zimbabwe is rich in minerals and mineral wealth. This is what is going to make this country wealthy. And third, Zimbabweans have begun to awaken. They have begun to realize no one is going to build this country. And that mantra is what makes Zimbabweans great. Is they're beginning to believe in their own country. And they're beginning to work. Today, if you brought white people back and you said, right, give them back the farms, no one will give them back the farms because every Zimbabwean believes, I can do it myself. The spirituality of this nation is deep. We're probably one of the most spiritual countries on the continent, maybe even in the world. We need to harness that, and it is a beautiful thing about us. Number five, this country is one of the most beautiful countries in the world. Hence, when Wodemaya came here, he said, I have been to many countries. But this is probably one of the most beautiful countries I've ever been to. So those things are the things that we need to embrace about our country. It is special. No, no, no. no I totally understand. And, um, you know, like I noticed that you mentioned more spirituality. I know that you never, you're like, are you Christian? I am in transition. And I'll say to you I'm in transition. I grew up as a Christian. Um, I speak in tongues. But I've been questioning this Christianity. What did our ancestors worship before the Christianity? The colonizer came with the Bible. Are we saying that our, 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 our ancestors have lost, lost God? When I look at the result of the tree of Christianity, so when once Christianity came here and the fruits of Christianity started coming off the tree, capitalism came. Yet my ancestors used to take care of everybody in the community because we lived communally. Yeah. No one starved. No one was exploited because we lived together and we shared the little we have. The Christian society doesn't share. You go into churches where people speak in tongues, where people are, they don't share. They have Christians with nothing, poor, poverty stricken in the church with billionaires and multimillionaires. And so I'm saying, if this thing is the most righteous religion and it is a godly religion, why cannot not give life to people? When COVID came, I didn't see a single pastor who was healing COVID. They were speaking in tongues. They were uh, anointed with the Holy Ghost. Why couldn't they restore the people, the people's health? Why did HIV ravage Africa that has got the most prayer warriors? Why are people living in poverty? Why can't Christianity get rid of po poverty the way our traditional healers used to heal sickness, the way our traditional culture and our traditional religion made sure that everybody was provided for? 
You know, I asked you about the spiritual, uh, the spirituality uh, question, because yeah. uh, you, you, you very, you're an advocate for mining, and you talk about spirituality. How spirit, how spiritual is mining? Uh, how how intertwined is mining and spirituality? You know, I'm going to tell you right now that once you start bringing up the spirituality aspect in mining, I'm going to be exposed as a person who's contradicting myself because I don't know if we're supposed to be digging out what we dig out. I don't even know if we're supposed to be taking the gold out of the ground. I don't know if we're supposed to be taking the oil and the gas out of the ground. <coughs> but we're doing it because we are put into a Western system and a Western society that believes that that's the only way to survive. But I believe that we remained in our African culture where we travel telepathically, where we teleport from point A to point B, as some people still doing in this world that we live in now. <coughs> we wouldn't have needed to exploit the coltan, the cobalt, to have cell phones because we'd be communicating telepathically. We would be moving from point A to point B without aeroplanes, without cars. But we lost that spirituality when we lost our Africanness. Then we adopted this materialistic culture that is non-spiritual. Yet the people who run the system, the people at the top, the, what they call the black uh, 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 nobility, are spiritual. But they left us this materialistic thing that means nothing. And it is only then when we go back to the spirituality to realize that all the gold we're taking out of the ground shouldn't have been taken out of the ground. We should have been going to get the gold that comes out of our rivers after being silted from these places, but never digging it out. We're going to realize that digging out the fuel, the oil, the gas is destroying, is destroying the world. And that's why you're seeing the earthquakes are increasing, the balance of the earth has got problems. Even our spirituality has been affected the more gold we dig out of the ground. And have you ever wondered why the people who are so obsessed with collecting this gold are obsessed with collecting it? Because they know... <clears throat> the exoteric properties that they have. That's why the Jews have diamonds in all four corners of their offices. That's why the Indians are obsessed and the Europeans are obsessed with collecting gold because they use it for other things other than what they Yeah, have. like the, the, the bangles and everything is this. And, and you know, <clears throat> like, you know, just, just on a lighter note, just to ease it out, um, there's... You, you know, people get aggressive with you online, you know what I mean? Like, well, I don't agree with almost like i don't agree with a lot of things i should say i agree with a lot of things i should say as well and people can be vile and and and, and aggressive and violent on, online how do you how do you deal and build that mental fortitude i mean you're a human being you can only take so much um how do you deal with that and does it does it affect you you ignore them and uh, you just realize that they don't know what they're talking about and you pass on because um, I, I make it a point to read most of the comments because you must learn from other people. You must even learn from their criticisms of you. But when the comments are of no value, I don't give them precedence. I ignore them and move on. Because my job, I believe, is to impart what I know, to try and awaken some people, and for us to try and change the world. I'm not saying I'm perfect, but I believe that in part of my message, something inside there has got life, that is more than where we are coming from. Unsustainable, exploitative, corrupt culture. Because a lot of times people criticize me because I don't want to talk about corruption. And they criticize me because they lack knowledge to know that the system they're living in their own lives are the epitome and the definition of corruption, which is what we talked about. You've got a house, you got it from where? People are working for a corporation, you work for a bank, and you say to me that, other people are corrupt. The banking system in its own respect, just the usury, just the interest rates, are corruption of the highest order. Do you know what I'm saying? So, so you know, like you mentioned, you know, you got a, you got a son, right? Yeah. And I know this, this, this is an issue that's probably very dear to your, to your heart. Like when we live in a, in a generation and a time where a lot of kids and a lot of this young men are, are offing themselves, they're killing themselves, the suicidal rate is through the roof. Do you feel like, and any alternative voice that preaches uh, masculine men is silenced, do you feel like men globally are under attack? And how do we combat this rate of men committing suicide? Yeah, men are under attack. I mean, I've got a company in South Africa. When I go to meetings, 
we sit in the meeting with my partner who I had to give a certain percentage of the company for her to control it. And I'll get into a meeting and they say, we don't want to hear what you've got to say. What has the lady got to say? Even when we're in a strategic meeting where we're talking about marketing, communication, branding, which is I'm the specialist of that, they want her, a person that is dealing with administration, to talk about it because I'm a man and she's a woman. She must be empowered, must be given the opportunity to speak and mustn't be a shadow of me. When training sessions come, when organizations that are supposed to help businesses get more business, they're all women orientated. And the question is, and it's happening to black women, to, to, to black men more than white men. In white society, white men are still the ones who dominate everything. A lot of times the women are at home, they're running a cake shop, they're running a flower shop, they're running other things other than butting heads with the men in the corporate system. And the black people, because we don't control our economies, they've allowed that to happen because they want to empower the women to weaken the men because men are the defenders and the fighters for any nation. So if you are a man and you have no money, you can't get a gun. If you are a man, you have no money, you can't get a safe for a gun so they won't give you a gun license. And when you don't have a gun, you can't fight other races and other people who are stronger than you because you've got no weapon to fight. When they rape your woman, when they rape your child, you can't do anything about it because you don't have the power. And when you do fight another man and you kill another man, you don't have money to go to court, so you're going to go to prison. That is the system that they're creating. And our women have taken this hook, line, and sink. But when they then get raped by a white man at work, they don't have anyone to protect them because the husband is weak or they don't have a husband. The men in the police force are usually shallower in terms of intelligence. They don't have the capacity or the mental fortitude to fight more powerful white people who are exploiting our women in the workplace. The men, black men cannot create companies to employ their daughters and their wives. So their wives are always slaves and servants of whites, Indians, who can do whatever they want to give them promotions or more money. So that is a system our women have been co-opted into without the intelligence of recognizing that the more our men are disempowered, the more weaker we are and the more vulnerable we are and we don't have any heroes to protect us and to shield us from the attacks of other races. So our women need to rethink and relook and reconsider. And it starts in the home. Nowadays, even daughters stand up to you as a father and basically tell you that you are nothing because they've been empowered to believe that. But the day she gets into trouble outside, she needs a father strong enough to stand up for her. So in South Africa right now, we've got a situation. We've got xenophobia that says foreigners mustn't get any opportunities, mustn't get anything. And on that, there's the layer of men and women. Yeah. But you make a South African woman pregnant, you're expected to look after her and her children. With no job. How? With no job. If it's in business, we're being denied the business, we're being denied tenders, we're being denied business by business, by private uh, companies, because you are foreign and you are a man. So how do you look after your children? It's crazy, man. That's and, crazy. and remember, the South Africans that are saying that foreigners must not get jobs, they are the brothers, sisters, and uncles of these same women. That will have to take care of this. And then those women don't go and say, when there's xenophobia is happening, they don't stand up and say, no. Foreigners are the fathers of our children. We want them to have equal opportunities so that they can look after their children. They keep quiet. And they still expect you to fulfill a miracle in the process. <laughs> Yo, as we wrap up, we are heading to an interesting time every five years in this country, the <clears throat> 2023 elections. And I'm not going to ask you who you're voting for. I'm asking you <laughs> if you believe in this flawed system called democracy. It's crazy. It's a flawed system that has us competing against each other every five years, has us spending hundreds of millions of dollars that we could use to build hospitals, roads, and infrastructure and basic services. We're using them to campaign, to wear funny clothes, to wear hats, to produce T-shirts, to travel and to, to, to electioneer. It's, it's madness. You know, you know why? I, I, you know, my, my problem with democracy is that, like, if we've got, let's say we've got 10, and don't get me wrong, if we've got 10 people who can't reason uh, or smart enough you know, like, and then you've got one who actually says, guys, I've been there, I've seen it, this is how the future looks like, or whatever. Why should, and then the other guys are saying, yo, let's go this way, and then we're going to drown when we go this way. But if, so, I mean, why should, 
that's that's the problem I have. Why should the people make decisions? Yes. Like, why should? And the funny thing is that the I know this is gonna be taken out of context, but. Why should dumb people make decisions for smart people in the world? <laughs> anyway, guys, it's been another episode of uh, the Bold Exchange with the brother man, Richard Matijara. Guys, make sure you go out there and vote and exercise your right to vote. And no, 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 no. Before, before, before we, we go any further, I wanted to ask though, before we go, why is it that like our politicians always go on, um, on foreign uh, TV? What's fascinating about foreign TV? I don't understand that. Well, for instance, I know you're asking about why the uh, foreign minister went to the South African TV, for instance, as an example. No, no, no. I'm just saying, like, in general, like, whether... The reason is they have not created communication platforms in Zimbabwe that are well-funded to take the message of Zimbabweans out into the international community. So that's the very first problem. Secondly, like now, we don't have the media houses that can contest in terms of share of mind with South African media. So if you want your message to go outside Zimbabwe and all over the continent and to be syndicated into the international media, you have to go to the South African media. So sometimes they're forced to have to go there, but they're forced because they haven't invested in creating their own media houses. Ah, nice. Guys, show up at Okdara, guys. Anyway, uh, 